but this is a value stream map, as you guys know. Uh, you guys have been learning about this a bit in your classes, I believe, so you should be familiar. Uh, I'm going to start off briefly and go over some stuff about the company. Oh, I need a clicker, Ramesh. I don't know if you have one, but... I can, I can flip the... Uh, this is just briefly about the company history. We don't have a lot of time, so we're not really going to go through this for very long. But uh, Sahi Kasei is a corporation, is a $20 billion corporation. We are just one piece of the large puzzle. Uh, their, Asahi has a chemicals division, a housing division, electronics, a few other things, medical division. We are in the chemicals, and within that, we are in, elect, uh, in plastics. So, uh, like I mentioned, $20 billion globally. The majority of that's broken down into the chemicals, which we fall under. Uh, fibers, critical care. I touch on most, most of those. We are a global company. Uh, our branch here gets supplied from Japan, Singapore. Thailand, a few places. Our main uh, North America headquarters is in New York. Uh, we are obviously in Fowlerville, and we are going to be opening a new manufacturing plant in Athens, Alabama. Coming, well, should be completed by the end of 2015 and start producing uh, mid year next year, 2016. So, well, first quarter. First quarter, 2016? Yeah, producing. Yeah, but our first quarter's in April. Yeah, but I'm from January 2016. So, you can't, you can't see the slide very well, but this is basically what we make. It's a pink pellet. We make mostly black, but I guess pink was a prettier color. They decided, so. Uh, some common products that you're familiar with. The Ram, Dodge Rams. Uh, this RAM box that we created uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, this has won uh, a bunch of innovation awards for the most innovative use of plastics. What is that? It's the the RAM boxes in the. Let me let me explain. You ever take okay. it? Jason, can you switch uh, off that those it, lights? The RAM box, you know, right along the. On top of the wheel well, on either side, okay, there you have you have an option of buying this box, which can be locked, okay. So you can keep stuff. I mean, people that people that are, that are in the trade, they can keep tools, okay. If you are into fishing, you can keep your fishing rods, so guns and everything. If you are into hunting, okay, it's a it's a pretty popular option with the ram box or with the dodge ram. And the uniqueness about the particular box is that this is six feet four inches long, okay? So if you want to sleep inside it, you can probably sleep inside it too. Uh, but the dimensions, okay, the lid has to be pretty flat, okay, because it's, and in addition to that, it needs to support the weight of two people sitting on it, okay? Imagine tailgating, and uh, so two 250 pound individuals sitting on it, so there was some structural requirement. We make the pellets, okay? We supply it to customers that actually mold these parts or extrude and make these final parts. But we are at the bottom of the food chain, you know, we make the pellets. Yes. Another key thing about this, there's a drain on it, so you can put ice in it. And then you can imagine everything else. <laughs> So a key point, we don't actually mold any of the parts. Uh, we create the plastic and send it to the injection molders where they actually make the, the parts. Uh, another famous product in the Cadillac, we have the sunroof uh, frame. And like I said, we don't have a lot of time, so we also create furniture. Uh, our business is probably 70% or so automotive, but we do furniture and water tanks and a few other products. Uh -huh. okay. So to get into some of what we are going to be doing over the next two weeks. Yeah, 
is creating a value stream map, as you guys know. Uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar. This is a basic value stream map, uh, similar to what you guys are going to be producing with our processes. We should be able to uh, provide you with all the information to fill this out. Uh, we're planning on going over what we can today, but having an open dialogue over the next couple weeks where you'll be assigned a representative and you can reach out, email, or call us at any time and should be able to fill in any gaps because obviously we're not going to be able to go over everything in the next 15 minutes of our business here. So, uh, <clears throat> Some of how it's made. I might have, Corey is more of the expert in the back here, I might have him touch on some of this stuff a bit more, he's a process engineer, so he uh, is more familiar with the day-to-day the -day manufacturing than I am, but, anyway, oh wait, we gotta go to, put it on two different, here you go, a little Spartan for you. <laughs> All right, hey guys, as Jason said, my name is Corey. Um, this is a helicopter view from our facility. So you guys came into the guard shack. Oh, I didn't know it was time off. I do that. I'll have to take that off, we'll see. So anyways, uh, you guys came through the guard shack. You might have saw the big shiny silos coming in as you walked in. Um, our facility is a very linear flow. So as you can see, uh, we have a bunch, we have a rail yard, a bunch of rail, uh, raw materials come in gets pumped into our silos. And our facility is basically three different sections. You can see on the west side is our raw material warehouse. Our center, which is all the high point, is our processing area. And then the east side is our shipping area. And so raw materials come in one end, get converted into finished product, and get shipped out the other end. Um, again, this is just kind of looking at our receiving area. So we have a lot of our polymers come in rail cars. A lot of that gets pumped into the silos. Um, however, we also get trucks full of fiberglass pigments and different additives for our materials. Corey did not know he was going to be presenting today or know these slides, so. So I'm Fair really way. winging it. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Just so you know, you can make sound effects. <laughs> um, this is taking a look at our mixing operations. Okay, so. Um, our plant is divided up into both continuous and batch processes, okay? And so this is looking at our continuous lines right now where we are constantly feeding material into our extruder and each one of our raw materials have a designated feeder. There's a few more similar slides so you can okay. stand up. Um, again, this is, so we are looking at our continuous. Like I said, we also have a batch process. Um, you know, batch versus continuous, you know, batch we are shutting down in between grades, whereas continuous we are trying not to shut down and doing a running changeover, as we call it. Um, but this illustrates the mixing process for a batch operation. Uh, okay, so this is, a, this is a, an extruder. Um, does anyone know, how many people know what an extruder is? Anyone? Okay, that's not bad. Um, think of it as like a big bread mixer or a spaghetti mixer, okay? So in your back, you have a motor and a gearbox, and then through this section, all of our materials come in here, and basically we're applying heat, pressure, and friction to melt down all those raw materials, and then it comes out as finished product at the far end. This is looking at, again, the finished product side of our extrusion process. You can see all of the extruders that you just saw were in the back, and um, I don't know if they have seen our finished product at all, have they? Just a snapshot of a pellet. All right, so as you know, our finished product is pellets, okay? Um, and so we have all of our pellets coming out of our classifiers, and then they go into the packaging, which might be boxes, it might be supersets, uh, or it might be daler truck. Or, have uh, bulk trucks and we're going to walk through the plant and you're going to be able to see some of this. So some of the previous slides he showed you were kind of taking place back there. Uh, the finished product gets dried in this kind of middle area heading up and then it goes into a pelletizer which 
chops the strands of melted plastic once it's cooled, drops it back into pellets, and goes into a sifter, I don't know the technical term. Classifier. Classifier, where it uh, gets rid of the, the pellets that don't meet the size specifications and gets uh, pumped directly into the packaging. It's all one continuous step instead of two uh, different steps. So. Um, so this is looking at our testing laboratory. You know, we do all of our product qualifications here in-house. And so um, per the customer requirements, up to every batch of material is tested. Um, and that could be a variety of testing based on whatever the customer requires. Okay? However, it does add a lead time because our product cannot leave our facility until it's been qualified for the customer specification. That's me. <laughs> this is uh, looking again at uh, different packaging options. Um, a major for a lot of our high volume customers is putting into a bulk truck. Uh, we can blow directly into a bulk truck from our production lines, again, uh, skipping over any secondary steps, and then it can simply go out to our customer from there. This is a closer look at the packaging of Octavin boxes. Um, you know, how much can fit into a box is dependent on the bulk density of the material, and also how much we can fit onto a truck. Thank you. Explain it more elegantly than I could. So. But think of our process as making sausage. You're taking and think of the, you're adding meat, which is the plastic, or think about it as rice, and then you're adding spices to it, and then that's the glass and other items that we add to it. Then it comes out of the machine as spaghetti, and we chop it back up into rice. Yeah. Can you talk about different specifications of the pellets that you make um, that you have to make. What do you, what exactly does it mean? Different customers have different requirements for the grade of plastics or something like that. And do you make it in, in a batch, all in a once, or how how does that happen? Just so want to know how the process works in that way. There's there's two uh, points to it. The classifier that I was mentioning uh, sifts out the, the plastics that don't get chopped correctly that are either too big or too small. But from there, the product testing, yeah, different customers depending on the application have different uh, specifications that we have to meet. The automotive industry is a lot stricter than the furniture industry, for example. But going back to making sausage in a sense, <laughs> some sausage has more spices in it. Mm -hmm. Some of our uh, plastic has more glass in it or more coloring in it or more additives in it. Some sausages may have uh, um, uh, different kinds of meat you add some pork, you add some beef, we use different kinds of plastic. And so it, each it, one, each product could be a whole different recipe, just like for Okay, so. I'm sorry, I like, I like. <laughs> Someone's hungry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, you gotta, you gotta get that fake bacon. No. <laughs> and a good way to kind of think about our, our business model, a lot of our business is automotive, and with all the um, emission, requirements that the government's coming out with, the automotive industry is shifting to lighter weight, cheaper cars to achieve those high miles uh, per gallon. So an automotive or a supplier will come to us and say, okay, we have this part that's been predominantly nylon or predominantly steel or whatever material. Can we use a cheaper, lightweight polypropylene and meet all the same requirements? So our R&D will go to work creating, okay, well, if we add this much fiberglass and this and this and this, we can basically achieve the same specifications, but uh, a lot cheaper product. So that's kind of the majority of, of our business. So one of the main things, uh, reducing the lead time of our overall process is important. Uh, you want to move ahead with this one? You can, <laughs> sure. <laughs> So we buy raw materials, we sell finished goods, right? And then uh, there is a time be between the time, there is a time lag between the time that we buy the raw materials and the time that we sell the finished products, okay? For most of, for, in most of the cases, we buy the products based on the price that exists at that particular time, okay? 
And all of you guys know what has happened for happened to the price of gas over the past, say, four or five months, okay? And it reflects in this curve over here. Crude oil, you know, I mean, used to be in the 95s and the 100s, and over the past, say, three or four months, it has, it has dropped to below $50 per barrel. Same thing happens with our raw materials too, okay? Where in our raw materials, it is directly linked with crude oil. You know, I mean, it used to be close to a dollar, and now it is close to say 70 cents a pound, okay? Mm. So if you bought a product at say a dollar, and three months later, if you are still carrying that inventory, we just lost 30 cents a pound, okay? So it is crucial for us to kind of reduce the time between the time that we purchase the raw material and the time that we sell the finished products because it could swing both ways, you know, in the event that the prices go up from say $50 to $100 per barrel, it could benefit us, but you know, as a practice, we want to kind of reduce the time between the time that we purchase and the time that we sell the finished product. So we got three scenarios that we want to kind of run through and, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> sure. So the first scenario has to do with our continuous process. Um, from our line one, it's one of our fastest producing lines. And it's one of uh, it's the product that we produce the most of out of out of any of our products. So thirty percent glass filled polypropylene. So the basic process we get polypropylene via rail car that gets pumped into our silos. Um, the silos are low. While that's going on, we receive pigment in rail cars. And that's also getting pumped in the silos. And we receive glass fiber via truck load a couple times a day. Those all get extruded uh, as Corey is talking about. Get put in an extruder at different times and, and melt down and, and make the, the final plastic. We'll kind of go through it a bit more when we actually are out on the plant. You can actually visualize and see some of it. And those get, for the most part, directly pumped into the bulk trucks to deliver to the customers, which is nice because it eliminates the packaging and the pallets and a lot of other costs. So that's the first value stream that I think we're going to have two groups map out. The next one is, is from a smaller line. Uh, we get raw pigment in. About two weeks before the, the line is going to run, the, the pigment gets blended into the pigment room. And that's what, sometimes four or five different pigments will blend together to achieve certain color matches. A lot of the automotive industry is very strict. You won't believe how many different kinds of black there are. <laughs> so they have to be blended uh, exactly right and tested. and. We have color matching teams and everything out in the lab that do all of that. Uh, from there, it gets put in the barrels where it sits until it uh, has to be extruded. And when it's time, once again, the, the pigments and the acetal gets extruded and put into boxes kind of directly from the line. And we have all the data and different times and, and stuff to support some of these. And then the third process is similar, but after there's a, a next step, after it goes into the boxes, days or up to a week later, we might <clears throat> transfer it from the boxes into paper bags, 55 pound paper bags. Uh, it's kind of whatever the customer wants us to, wants the packaging. So there's a final step in the process, but the beginning steps are the same. Uh, do we have So basically your assignment is to use a value stream to reduce the, the overall lead time of our process from getting the raw materials in to shipping out to the customer. Uh, so by creating a current state value stream map of, of what we're currently doing and then any improved future state map, creative ideas that you have, ways that we can eliminate non-value-added activities, ways we can cut down on, on some of the lead times. 
uh, whatever your, your ideas are. So keep calm and, and think differently outside of the box. I think that's the PowerPoint. <coughs> we have that other sheet that has some of the numbers that we came up with. I don't know if we want to go through some of those now or if we want to open it up to questions based on Let's that. open it up to questions and you know we can we can give them a handout of the other information. Yeah. So I had a question about you said you take the plastic out of the boxes and rebag them. <coughs> why couldn't you I mean, why, why, does, why is there a process where it's been boxed and then rebagged? Corey? Um, it's mostly manpower, actually. We don't have the, uh, our bagging operation is a completely separate area of the plant and it's a completely separate operation. Um, so we don't have the manpower or resources to do it directly off the line. And besides that, there is a weight difference to coming out of the extruder. The the rate at which the product comes out from the extruder is, say, 1,500 pounds per hour, okay? But we cannot bag at that rate. Mm -hmm. It's a slower, it's a slower operation. Same thing, one, one, one pallet an hour? Thousand pounds an hour. Our bagging unit was put in as a, to do just a small amount of bagging for special customers. And like anything, if we have it, it grows. <laughs> So do you use manual labor or uh, do you have a rotary factor or something? Manual labor. So have you ever seen a dig bag in operation it's automatic? Yeah. This one is again very slow, very manual. Mm -hmm. How much of your business currently is going towards the using the bagging operation? Because you said it grew, it's, it's been growing. Yeah, so it's probably up to about a half a percent. We do 240 million pounds. Uh, we're probably doing three to 500,000 pounds of that. I thought it was more than that. It could be now. Yeah, it's close to, close to a million pounds. So uh, half a percent is right, okay? Um, so we make about, say, 250 million, 40 million pounds, of which half a percent is bad. Can you go back two slides real quick? Yeah, so can you do this polypropylene and the acetal uh, processes concurrently, or do you have to switch over those processes? So we have, I don't even know, 10? 10, ten, production, ten production lines. You should probably know that. So we have 10 production lines. This process is taking place on lines one and two, on a few of the lines, and the acetal process is taking place on a few other lines, so they can uh, take can place concurrently. When you colorize the plastic, is it the same process for every color, or is it, or do certain colors require special processes? <coughs> By the way, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I more than one process. Okay. The process is the same, okay, but uh, just like, just like you know, I mean, if you, if you talk in terms of colors, black is one extreme, natural is one extreme, right? Mm -hmm. So you got the whole spectrum of colors in between. And uh, colors, some colors can be masking of previous colors. Like if I if I have to make a dark blue, it can mask a yellow, right? So, but if I if I go from a black to a natural, okay, it's a major changeover for us. We need to clean the entire extruder, move it out, make sure that there is not a single speck of black in there because it would show up in the natural that we make later on. So though the process is the same, okay, from an extrusion standpoint, if you look at the overall, you know, if you include the changeover and everything, mm -hmm. it is different. So when you do all of that, is there, do you, do you have to mix the colors, the coloring process or the lack of coloring process in at the time of extrusion? Like it can't, you can't, you have to colorize the plastic then as opposed to another time? That is correct. That is correct, yeah. Okay. So, but just, just to finish up on the coloring, depending on which line, mm -hmm. the coloring could go in different ways. It could go in as a powder, it could go as a concentrate, it could be fed in, it could be blended with a blend. Okay. Uh, so there, there are some different ways they'll go inside. And the two examples are extreme. One is the black and the day line five is the red, mm -hmm. which is what you all look at. So um, a question I have about changing over the colors. 
can you go continuously darker and just lose a part of the use of sausage example to go from chicken to beef? Can you have that chicken beef mixture and throw it out and then sooner or later it gets to the new meat? Yes and no. Yes okay. and no. You, you, from the extruder perspective, you can. From the finishing part, if you have pellet of the other pellet in there, uh -huh. you have to clean all that equipment completely. Okay. Because of one pellet is a problem for a customer. Got it. Even if it's truly not a problem, in the sense that it really wasn't that good quality, they see it as a problem. I understand. That's just, just want to make the story. Is that a reasonable answer? There's been a case where we're supplying a customer with a, a white product, and there's been a couple of red pellets, and when they start molding parts, they're all coming out pink. Just a few bad pellets can really impact the whole shipment. So. And give us some information about the quality check process. Is it the, is it the sampling process or how it, how it is working for any when it comes to different products for different customers? We have a sampling plan for every product. Okay, and the sampling plan depends on the number of times that we have produced the product. If we have a lot of historical information, the amount of tests that we do is minimum. Okay. So we do certain tests every lot, okay? There are certain tests that are, that are done right at the extrusion line itself so that we don't produce a whole bunch of product and then realize that it is no good, okay? And we can show you that when you walk into the plant as to the checks that we do online. There are certain checks that we do after the product is made. There are certain checks that we do once a quarter. There are certain checks that we do once a year. So we have a plan for every product depending on the Comfort level as well as the amount of uh, experience that we have with that product. Uh, given the fluctuation in the crude oil price and how it affects the raw material cost, do you ever try to adjust how much you want to stock up and buy to forecast what are the best time to get more raw material? Actually, that is a that is a very good question. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, you could, I mean, we could, and sometimes we try to do it. But, you know, if we know exactly where the market is going to go, I wouldn't be working over here. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ever heard of somebody named Warren Buffett? <laughs> he sells insurance. His company, Do Not Hedge, because he makes a lot of money on insurance, which is really hedging. Uh, but we try to hedge a little, but you're talking hedging uh, a couple million pounds here and there. I mean, I mean, it comes down to the amount of risk versus reward, right? I mean, right now, right now, the downside is minimal because it has come down significantly, okay? And you can see it, it, the curve, you know, I mean, there was a certain amount of resistance that it already tested and it bounced back up, okay? So we are close to the bottom, but at the same time, it's a significant amount of cash outlay, and, you know, uh, you got to balance the risk versus reward. Yes, uh, so the tables are stored in silos. So those aren't the external silos, are those silos within the facility here? The black pigment, which we use a lot of, it is, it is stored in the outside side. Okay. Uh, How many it's different it's color variations are there? Color is just hundred. There's several hundred. But there's more pigment in, in one of those silos up there? Yeah, and that, that's for the high volume, okay. basic black. Mm -hmm. Everything else is done. Uh, No, only for the one, the one, one high volume we have in the concentrate. Everything else, it could be in a box this big. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very, very, very depends on which thing it is. All the other silos are being used for different types of products. Okay, so we have about six, six different products all being used. And our pigment calls range significantly. I mean, uh, I'll let you answer on the low end. Low end is less less than a dollar a pound. The high end is probably two hundred and fifty dollars a pound. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do they cost to take stored in? Typically drums, mm -hmm. fiber drums. Uh, question about when you make a uh, very strong mat, so you need to calculate the the, the tight for each process. So how do you calculate? You use the stopwatch to calculate, or you? Uh, it's an average time or is it the worst case? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have average time, historical data. Some of the processes are kind of hard to calculate, but we can, we can get really good estimates. 
based on years worth of data. So uh, some of the extrusion process, since we track by lot, we have when each lot started and finished, and by material, <coughs> all the historical data for that <coughs> year to, to pull some of that information. So you, you get a people to uh, ready to uh, calculate the time? Uh, it is part of the manufacturing process. The the line operators as they're starting the batches, uh, they write down. Since we have special blends, we have to calculate and write down how much of each raw material is going in. And occasionally, when we run it, it's not meeting the specs that that we're expecting. So we'll have to add more of a certain raw material to, to get it to meet the right specifications. So everything's being tracked when, they, when they're when they adding the material, how much, the dates, the, the lots, everything. So Could you ask the question one more time? Uh, um, I just want to know, how do you calculate uh, the, the time to spend on each per step? From, from each step? Yeah, yeah so yeah. each step, the, the cycle time, the change over time, up time, that sort of thing. We have that, but if you're looking at it from time it takes, say, the guy to blend it, and then he will store it in inventory, and then it's ready for the next guy that he wants it, is what we do today. So we don't have, you know, in other words, everything isn't a time step, but the change in the process, we do time on a macro level, not a stopwatch, because it takes hours. Um, but we don't, from thinking about doing, you know, turning one knob and how many seconds before you turn the second knob, our process doesn't isn't timed that way or exactly works that way. You get a little bit better feeling after you walk through. Mm -hmm. Do you have a cycle time today or a pack time that you're aiming for? Anything like that? And, and changeovers uh, for different types of changeovers, yes, we do. Yeah, changeovers would probably be the the most specific area that we would like to to see improvement. Uh, we do have a lot of historical data okay. on the time it takes to do the changeover. It can be a little bit complex because it depends on the product you're coming out of and the product you're going into, and that changes uh, all the time. So you don't have 100 changeovers. You have from 1 to 2, from 2 to 1, from 1 to 4, from 3 to 5, all the different processes. Yeah, right? Typically, we measure that from um, certain materials require certain screw configurations. So when you're down there looking at the extruders, all of our extruders are twin screw co-rotating. and. Um, they're built with elements on the shaft, so we have a lot of different screw designs. So some products may take a completely different screw design, so you have to pull the screws out, rebuild them, put a new screw in. Um, and then the other way that, uh, that we bundle the, the materials is they might take the same screw, mm -hmm. but they might have a different L value, which when we talked about light to dark, color in general has uh, three basic values, as an L value, an A, and a B value. And we try to look at it from the L value because that is the light to dark. And typically, we try to run light to dark from that idea of it taking less time to transition from one to the other. So ideally, we stick within one screw family, run light to dark, and then do a screw change, and then start that process over. Again. So we have that data that shows from screw to screw how long that would take, as well as from um, color to, to another color. So here is generally our changeover uh, data from a dark dark to a white product on line five. It's a five hour change. If you're going light to dark, uh, four hours because that's easier. This is a similar color, but this click will go again. Similar color, but but still different. You have two different kinds of black, if you want to imagine. You know? Yeah, it's like a two-hour change. The screw changeovers is what's really the big time. 16 hours to do a screw changeover. So we have to pull the twin uh, twin screws, clean everything, clean out all the piping and everything. And as you can see, uh, these each line is a different product that we typically run on line five. Uh, so. This will be one type of screw we have, and to run this product and then this product, uh, we'll have to do a full screw change, which is a 16-hour process. Uh, I don't know.
know how much we want to get into this file. Can you can you also elaborate on the information flow part? How how does the information from the customer come in in terms of their forecast? Uh, how many customers do you have, and all those things? Because we probably would be needing that as well. So that information from customer to your production control, how does that work out? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it, the information's coming in all different ways. Uh, some customers give us <coughs> accurate forecasting. Some customers say take 10,000 pounds a month, and it's consistent. Some customers are uh, fluctuate quite a bit. Some customers don't provide any forecasts, and they'll call in an order, say, hey, by next week I need 10,000 pounds. And it can be uh, difficult to try to plan with those sort of processes in place. I don't know if you want to touch more on that besides it. Yeah, so in, in practicality, we have, we use SAP here as our ERP system, and uh, we have somebody that's responsible for forecasting. So as Jason mentioned, we gather information a lot of different ways, and the responsibility of this individual is to actually upload that data into SAP, and we use that to drive the independent requirements. So all the raw materials that are required to produce those finished products that are forecasted will show demand to the purchasing group and then we'll procure those raw materials uh, in time to produce the product based on the dates that are specified. Um, from the customer standpoint, for the most part, we make the order. So when the order comes in, we have standard lead times based on what line the, the product is produced on. Uh, and those specific orders will come into the line schedule and the schedulers try to optimize the efficiency of the line based on some of the data that we talked about, uh, grouping like screws together for products that are required and then running the colors, so let's say from light to dark. Because we are capacity constrained right now, so it's extremely important that we improve the efficiency of the lines to try to get more output. Um, so in general, that's kind of how the information kind of flows through our system. I don't know if that answers your question well enough. So you want to know like how many customers? You oh, probably yeah. have four to five hundred customers. How many products? Four to five hundred products. Active. Active? Probably three thousand in the Yeah, I, I did a study. Over the last few years, we sold 969 different products. Mm -hmm. out of the we probably got one more question and then we're gonna have to take the rest offline or, or something because we gotta do the plant tour so I know you had your hand up. So, the product did not meet the uh, specification. What do you mean with that? It depends on the product. Um, we try to work that back into our process. It depends on what the miss is. Um, if the miss is determined that we can bleed that back into uh, our finished product, it'll go back into the process. Sometimes it goes back through to where it gets re-extruded, and sometimes it would get blend, uh, bled in back over the, the finished deck where we're doing the classifying. But there are instances uh, that we will not rework the process or the material, and that typically will get sold to a recycling company that we work with, and they'll find outlets for that material. Not sold under our name, but sold just generically out into the market. Or sold in the secondary market. When you sell in the secondary market, you can't sell something that costs a dollar for about 30 cents. If you sell it scrap, you're going to get about 10 to 15 cents. So, how much the uh, special variation? Of the raw material or the finished product? Finished. finished product, probably around 1% overall. And a good portion of that is just based on our process. So when we're doing some of these changeovers, we'll have a uh, purge that we purge essentially onto the floor. And those uh, purge patties end up going to the recycler as well. So I don't have the specific numbers between what's truly uh, non conforming <laughs> material and then what would be just uh, part of the process. And the amount uh, part of the process is dependent on how many changeovers you do with it, etc. Yeah, our, our scrap is probably about 1%. Just to give you a perspective, 1% is about $2.4 million. Um, and our old material, which is stuff that we didn't make correct the first time and you have to rework or sell the secondary market, um, yeah, I don't have the numbers. Yeah, but that's a half million pounds over 240 million. Um, a quarter of a portion. 
quarter of a percent. Sometimes it peaks a little bit, and sometimes it goes down uh, about a quarter of a percent. Yeah, we're gonna have to. But, yeah. Before you guys go out, uh, first I want to thank you all. I need to run also, but there's about 25 of you here.